coming up on UGTV. A special session of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. All right, I'm going to call this meeting to order. I want to um, thank everyone for coming tonight. I'm going to ask the clerk to please announce the meeting and call the roll. A notice of special session was called for December 17, 2015, immediately after the 5 o'clock p.m. executive session for a presentation on the water pollution control plan. Roll call. Bynum? Here. Walker? Here. Townsend? Here. McKiernan? Here. Mergia? Johnson here. Kane here. Markley here. Walters here. Philbrook here. Holland here. All right, we have a presentation tonight on water pollution control. Um, this is the presentation we're going to become very familiar with over the next six months. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bach for pre uh, initial presentation. Thank you, Mayor Commission. Um, tonight is really intended to be one to go back with somewhat of an overview of where we are with water pollution control as we start to move forward with the direction to move forward and adopt a plan later this year or later in 2016. As you're all aware we had a pending consent decree that really was set out for how we were going to work with our combined sewers um, and how we could correct that plan in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, we do realize that this is a, a major cost to our community going forward, but it is one we are being required to do by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, those negotiations will take place over the course of the next several months as we finish our plan, and then they have to adopt it. So this is our opportunity to stay informed as we go through this, 
make a decision and take a position uh, with the AP EPA that will be one that our community can afford um, but also meets those requirements. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mike Tobin and Trenton Fogelson, who are going to provide a presentation tonight. And Trenton, our Water Pollution Control Director, will be presenting most of the program, but uh, a couple of points to begin with. One, we are currently operating under a partial consent decree, and we have been for the last two and a half, three years. And uh, we have that as we move forward. We have to submit the final draft of the consent decree in September of 2016. This meeting is really the first of, of several. We'll be coming back. Uh, before you in, in three on threes and in some other group meetings as we move through the first quarter and into the second quarter of 2016 uh, and as Doug stated this is this is a large project a big budget impact and a big impact on our community having said that I'll now turn it over to Trenton thanks Mike um, I'm Trenton Fogelsong I've been the director of water pollution control since March of this year um, the last time that I, I understand, I was here at the UG um, at the time, I didn't participate in it. The last time I think there was a wholesale presentation to the commission was about two and a half years ago. So I know we've had a lot of changes within our group um, and I think you guys have had a little bit of changes too. Um, so tonight I'm just gonna give a quick overview of our division, kind of where we're at, how we got where we're at and then what you could anticipate coming up. I may repeat a little bit of what Mike, Mike brought up here in a minute. Um, so just a quick overview again, we are a division of the Public Works Department. We fund 121 full-time equivalent positions, 114 of those are within the division. Um, our facilities and operations include... Can we get the slides moving, please? Oh, thank you. So we, our facilities do include the collection systems, both storm, sanitary and combined. Um, we have five wastewater treatment plants, wastewater pump stations, flood pump stations. And we also have a certified lab down at the Call Point treatment plant, and then we have a, a records and mapping group. So our primary goals, protect public health and environment, um, comply with regulations um, for the wastewater plant effluent, um, and our, our, our collection systems, um, also the solids disposals, our sludge from the uh, treatment plants and then air quality emissions from those. And then we also do uh, handle the air quality uh, compliance at John Garland Park as well. Um, and serve our, our customers at minimum cost with reliable utility service, and then uh, make sure we're planning ahead to accommodate growth in the community. Our funding actually comes from two enterprise funds, a wastewater sewer fund, which is uh, and a stormwater utility fund. The wastewater utility fund is actually a, a volume charge based on water usage during winter months. So people do not pay a wastewater bill based on um, irrigation, car washing, more summer activities where the water uh, wouldn't end up going into the sewer system and coming to us for treatment. So, you know, uh, pools, things like that usually, um, they don't, those wouldn't be filled in the winter time and those would, that water would not be coming to us for treatment. So that's the reason why a lot of, of agencies use the winter months for that billing. So we determine the usage for residential customers during those dry winter months, and then we just carry that charge through the whole year. The storm utility funding is, is actually just based on an improved lot, and it's a set fee per lot, an improved parcel. Um, our budget in 2016 is approximately 34 million. I'm going to ask when um, in January, I think you guys are coming back in January, I'm going to ask for a comprehensive breakdown of the wastewater utility operations and the stormwater utility operations. I want people to understand how those fee, you've explained it in kind of in shorthand. I want to, uh, there have been charts. I want to know when those fees started, how we collect them. They're on the BPU bill. I just want a comprehensive explanation of those two funds uh, okay. for the citizens so people can fully understand them. Um, so if you can plan next month to come back, I want a spreadsheet that shows how much money they collect, what the average collection is by household, um, 
some breakdown that we do on a fairly regular basis on our other fees, just so people can understand, you know, why do I have, why, how is, why is, why is wastewater only figured in the winter? And it makes sense, and I think we can do a more comprehensive explanation for that. How much money we collect from wastewater, how much we collect from stormwater. Um, it is billed on the BPU bill, so I just want people to be able to understand it and how much money is collected by each of those. I think the stormwater fee was instituted in 07 or 08, um, so I'd like to show the ramp up of that program and the why. I mean, we're going to get some of the why here in the, in the rest of your presentation in terms of the costs we're facing. Um, but I, and then a, a little more in terms of your budget, what you spend your resources on, just more explanation. So if you can plan on that for your next presentation, I would appreciate it. Mayor, could I add to that? I, I am also interested. Can you speak directly into the microphone, sir? I'm also interested in this topic, and, uh, you know, I've, I've been familiar with it for a number of years, but uh, I want to I have the angle of water conservation addressed and how our rates either promote or uh, are content neutral or, or do not promote conservation. For example, you mentioned swimming pools. Swim pools that I know of are usually drained down the driveway into the stormwater system. But you don't count that water in the computation of um, the, the fee because it doesn't occur during the winter months. So there is a inherent bias to me in the way we do rates that if you are one of these people that believe in conservation, you know, you flush your toilet once a day, you, you know, take one, a shower every other day instead of two a day, whatever the, the techniques are, you don't get much benefit from being a conservation-oriented person by conserving water, other than perhaps you don't pay as much, uh, as big a water bill, but your stormwater treatment bill or your sanitary sewer bill is generally speaking still going to be base when you use when everybody uses less water there's are you following me yeah um, I could reply a little bit to I don't, that. you don't not tonight okay yeah, let's, that's why okay there's a pretty I'm just interested in so that's part of your presentation as to how that does this encourage your or, or not encourage uh, conservation okay. because uh, I've had it argued to me where I could not respond that this, our system does not encourage water conservation. So there's a pretty broad reaching difficulty in understanding it because it's fairly, for the layperson, it's fairly complicated. So if you can just tee that up for our next meeting sure. and give us all the charts and information that we want just on those three bullets right here, I think that's going to help us a lot. Okay. I'll, I'll plan on that. Thank you. We are, we are a volume charge, though, just so you know just like your water bill. It is a volume charge. You use more, you pay more. You use less, you pay less. So conservation is encouraged. Yes. So, and maybe you can explain how that works okay. next time. Okay. Thanks. And just, and so you can see where we compare. Um, this is just a surrounding uh, communities here. The pink in the middle is the, the, just the sewer. This does not include the stormwater fee. This is just the sewer fees on average based on a, a water uh, 6,000 um, or 4488 gallons per month, which is an average residential use. So you can see we're, we're in the middle, the middle of the pack. We're not at the upper end, we're not at the lower end. So we do have a fairly complex infrastructure. We cover 158 square miles. Uh, we have about 44,000 accounts. Most of those are residential, uh, 3,500 are commercial. We operate five wastewater treatment plants. Um, we have 800 miles of combined sanitary sewers and out of the 300 miles of storm sewers that we maintain. We have 78 wastewater pump stations, nine flood pump stations, and you know, we, we coordinate and operate uh, in conjunction with two levy uh, protected districts. So 
so we're at a kind of unprecedented time in, in our utility. Here we are with this partial consent decree, um, which is requiring major enhancements across our system and within the administration. Um, we've got a significant sewer system upgrade out on the western part uh, of our service area. Um, we've got a real complex team, uh, internal and external consultants working on this plan, studying our system and uh, analyzing and determining what, what the best solutions are uh, for, our, for our community and our system. And all this comes uh, at the same time that we've, we've lost significant leadership within our organization. Um, and, and we also are approached to lose significant more leadership we have a significant portion of our staff is uh, 20, 25 years and, and on. So some of our challenges are internal staffing capacity and capabilities. Uh, it's a very competitive market. I think I've been hearing for 20 years when I went to engineering school that not a lot of people going into engineering anymore with the, the, the boom in technology. That's, I, I think we're starting to see that um, here in the public sector, you know, we're competing with private sectors. We're also competing with surrounding communities. So it is tough to recruit the talent that we really, really need. Um, trying to manage our rates, maintain affordability for our community, um, accommodating continued growth and trying to meet our federal criteria, both in an affordable and sustainable manner. Um, just going to talk a little bit about different types of sewer systems. We have a combined sewer system on the top here. That means there's one pipe out in the street. When it rains, water goes in a catch basin, um, runs off the street, goes into, in the same pipe as the sewer that comes out of somebody's house. Um, below that is a separate sewer system where there's two pipes in this, out in the street. One carries storm flows, the other one only carries wastewater flows. So here's a little bit better exhibit maybe to show how they operate. <clears throat> The combined system's on the left, dry weather's on the top on both of them, wet weather's on the bottom. So if you look on the left, you know, there's one pipe, you can see it, and during the dry weather flow on the top, all the flows contained in the pipe, it hits a diversion structure. Basically, it's like an overflow weir, but during low flow conditions, all that flow gets diverted and goes to the treatment plant for treatment. You can see in the bottom flow, when it rains and that pipe's flowing higher, whatever goes over that diversion structure exceeds the capacity of the pipe or the plant does end up going out to the rivers is dilute a uh, very dilute sewage mixture um, on the right you can see that they're just separate all together so anytime it rains the, the storm water goes straight out to the river although you know there a certain amount of storm water will find its way into our pipes that's why we're out doing some, some work on our systems to tighten them up try to keep the storm water out eliminate direct connections where people have connected their downspouts to our system. Here's our service area. So the pink area is our combined sewer service area. The teal color is our separate sewer air service area. And then the white area is outside of our service area down on the, bottom, the southwest corner of the county. Questions? Yes. Share that again. The, the teal colored area already has separated. They're separated, yes. As in, There's, it was built that way. Yes, yeah. The uh, and I and I kind of ran through that real fast, but um, you know, early in the the 1900s, that was through through probably mid century. State of the art was to build a pipe and take everything out, dump it in the river, send it downstream. So those tend to be in the older parts. You know, later in the 1900s, everything that was installed would have been put in as a separate sewer system. So to give, I, I would give it. No, teal is separated. The teal is good, red is, teal is good, red is bad. Is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess. Um, they both cost a lot of money. Red costs a lot more. But back in the day, you would have a stormwater system on a street. Someone would build their house. And they'd say, hey, I'll, run my, I'll just plug my sewer into that pipe out in the street. And they'd just run a pipe from their toilet to the street, and it would just go down the river. And everybody did that. And everywhere in this country they did it um, before mid-century. And then someone came up with the idea, some liberal, said you can't flush raw sewage down the river. No, some state entity. Yeah, that's right. So... It's a good idea. You should not flush raw sewage down the river. So every city in America 
that was built after the, that has origins before 1950 has to go back and separate their sewers. Kansas City, Missouri has a $2 billion system. New York City's is astonishing. Boston's is astonishing. The East Coast, the whole cities were built with combined sewers. So we're fortunate that it's only about a third of our city, um, but it's a lot of our city. But it was common practice. It's not like we did something wrong one day. That's just how it was done. And now it's illegal. And so the EPA is suing every city in America. And it's our turn. And we have to enter into a consent decree with them to commit a plan for how to separate all of our sewers. And so we are joining. And it's the same thing that we had to do with the BPU and the air quality stuff. The EPA sued every utility, and the BPU had to enter into a consent decree. We spent $250 million on scrubbers for a Dr. Seuss film, Knox and Socks, to get rid of the Knox and Socks out of the air quality. This is the lawsuit on our water quality that every city in America is going through. So company loves misery, um, but it's astonishingly expensive. But that's why we're doing this. It's because every city in America has the same challenge. They all have a map that looks something like this. The older parts are in red. The newer parts are in blue. And they have to go back and separate out the sewers. And just, if I could just add for clarification, stopping on this map, when you say UG sewer system service area, you have significant portions of area specifically north of Leavenworth Road that don't are not on sewer that's correct and so really and if, if you're not, not covered yeah. on this well right if you're on a septic system and there's a lot of areas of our city that are on septic you don't pay a sewer fee but you pay a stormwater fee okay. And, and, and part of part of what we're going through on our plan right now is looking at those areas out west that are undeveloped now to develop a plan as they develop how we will be able to provide service to them. How you'll be able to provide sewer service to those areas so they could connect into our system. Are you talking about areas that are developed also or only undeveloped areas? As they develop. So those that are developed now on septic that's not part of oh. what you're describing. there's um, there's a septic policy that i mean okay. there's even develops go developments okay. going on now that are going on in on septic okay. that that that's a but policy there's not let's just so. clarify we're, we're, you're not presenting a plan to take everyone off a of septic and put them on a sewer plan no, no. <laughs> that just say no please yeah, just say no. no because no. that's not what's happening here so okay. a lot of people okay. think our combined well, sewer is to get off septic no, no, but I'm it's simply pointing out that the map kind of says everything west of that pink line, and that's not technically is a service right. area, but it's not being okay. not it's all not all being serviced. Okay. That's that's right. I mean, there's there's the, the mayor said some things about sewer separation, and that's one strategy for combined sewers. That's not necessarily the strategy, and a lot of places that would be economically economically impossible. Okay where it's developed out, even how it's built up. So that is one strategy, and we've done that some here. Okay, um, septic tanks, when you start talking about these programs, you get into water qualities. There there are water quality trade-offs with septic tanks, but that's not part of this real charge. Okay. That's I something that, if, if that would be a policy for you all to entertain and consider down the road. Mr. Johnson. So we're talking about, in the pink section, adding a separate sewer system Yes or no? Not, not, no, not it, really. It's to deal with the. It's to deal with the. What the EPA is charging us with is to address water quality issues that result from overflows. Can you back up one slide? Sure. The lower left-hand corner is the problem. Right. Is when there's too much rain, it overflows the sewer system and it dumps raw sewage into the river. Combined right. sewer overflow, the CSO plan. That's the one we have to fix. There are a lot of strategies to do it. You can build a second pipe, or you could build bigger pipes. I mean, there's, you're going to talk about the different strategies okay. in different areas, because it's going to be multivalent. 
yeah, that, we're looking at all that in the plan, and and, and it's that's we're, that's really getting kind of off in the details a little bit, um, but you know that's really the charge the EPA came to us on was the impact from the CSOs, and we're we're really finding out, and you'll, we'll, I'll kind of talk on it here a little bit that that really the CSOs really aren't causing the, the rivers to not meet the water quality standards. I mean, it gets real complicated real fast, but it's, you know, it's the EPA and what they're, they're mandating. And so we have to balance that with our strategy of, of what, what we need to spend our money on and how we can show water quality improvements. Would that, would that require that we need more pump stations? I, I don't believe so. I mean, I, I mean, our goal is usually to eliminate pump stations. Can I ask that we let him just go through this because, and write down our questions because this is very complicated. And if we ask him as many questions as I can think of by myself, we'll never get through this presentation. And he's got to come back to us with all of these answers anyway. Well, and, and really tonight, we were really hoping to do an overview and kind of get through it and kind of get everybody reengaged and kind of set the stage. And when we come back in, in the first quarter of next year, we'll be doing the on threes and we can really get into the details and have a give and take and, and answer your questions probably much better there. Okay. And, it's and also, it's just also important. Our public needs to understand this because all the public sees is their sewer fee and their stormwater fee going up on their bill, on the BPU bill. And they want to understand why. And we need to explain it. Yes, yes, Mayor, but um, we need to do it in a manner in which they can understand it. And tonight, there's no way we could well, hop through all those. Yeah, we're getting there. One at a, yeah, we're getting there. Well, and I, I should have pointed out where this uh, where this changes from blue to pink. That's about 6:35. Just just for reference, it's kind of hard to see on the map. So here, here is a picture of some overflows occurring. Um, the top one is, is representative of a typical CSO structure that we might have in our system. Um, it's constructed. It's what it looks, what they would look like out there in the waterways. The photo on the bottom is, is probably something that would be more caused by a blockage in the system. We normally wouldn't design, you know, the system wouldn't allow it to pop up through a manhole lid in the middle of the street. I'm going to kind of go through some of these maybe a little quick here. Um, but obviously the reefs of untreated, uh, even though it's highly diluted sewage into, uh, into the waterways is a concern for bacteria, litter, and, and debris. So I'm going to kind of jump over to our, to our long-term control plan. So here, here, these are the regulations that came into place that, that are driving these. Um, early 70s, the Clean Water Act, and then the CSO policy came out in 1994. Um, they have something called nine minute controls on that. Uh, the UG studied, you know, came up with our long-term control plan in the late 90s. I'll go through that more here in a minute, but you guys were talking earlier about how this, on the East Coast in these big cities, that map here kind of speaks to that. You can see the cluster of all these CSO communities and the, the strategies that the EPA had, has taken on CSO enforcement. They kind of look for the low-hanging fruit, the big targets, the bigger cities, the bigger contributors, and so, you know, our turn in line just came. It's not unique to us, um, but it, they've just been going around the country. You know, KCMO was several years ahead of us. They're quite a bit bigger. <clears throat> so we came up with our plan and, and submitted it in 2000. And in 2001, we started doing sewer separations. That was a strategy that was really implemented down in Jersey Creek. And, that, and that's where a lot of our CSOs are. And so we were marching along, doing a lot of projects in the early 2000, uh, 2000s. And then um, in 2007, EPA uh, hinted that they thought we were doing things inadequately. Um, so they initiated um, negotiations with us back in 2008, alleging violations of the Clean Water Act. And those are some different components that, that they, they link up to it. Um, we did come to an agreement with them and it became effective in May of 2013. 
and that was the partial consent decree. And the reason we did a partial consent decree was to give us time to study our system, come up with a plan. It was anticipated to be about a five-year study window, and then we would come back to the table and negotiate a long-term plan with EPA. So um, by the time it all got negotiated and executed, we got something less than five years. Um, our plan is due September of 2016. The entire team has been working uh, in, in quite a flourish. It's a lot of work to do in a very short period of time. Um, it costs, costs money, of course. Um, one thing that I would point out is the word integrated. Um, when, we, when we entered into the partial consent decree and we're looking forward to this long-term control plan, it's changed over to an integrated overflow control plan. And at the time when we entered into it, it was really, we were integrating um, our separate sewer system and our combined system into one agreement with EPA how we were gonna address overflows in both of those. Um, in the meantime, a lot of stuff has, has come about in the industry um, and allowing a, a lot bigger look uh, instead of just ignoring the air quality regulations EPA mandates, the stormwater uh, regulations that are mandated, all these different um, regulations that um, in the past you tried, they would try to put blinders on and pretend that you didn't have to spend money and effort on the other programs. Now they're allowing you to kind of consider them all. And so that's what we're doing is with this integrated plan is looking at the big picture, realizing that the money ultimately comes out of one bucket. And if you spend twice as much over there, you have less to spend over here. So that's really, as we go through this, what the integrated plan allows us to do is max, allows us to find the opportunities to get the maximum benefit for the community at the minimum price to the rate payers. By integrated, do you mean air quality and water quality? Is that what integrated means? Well, it, 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 it means all those regulations. Um, for us, for us, it mostly means storm water and wastewater. Okay. And so far, this is the last letter we got from the Department of Justice saying we're doing a good job, we're meeting all the requirements. So that was back in November. Um, so there's just a quick quick overview of work that we've completed. Um, I did want to kind of highlight just a list of our team members real quick. Uh, Burns and Mac is a program manager. Then we're working with Burns and Mac, Black and Beach, HDR on basin work, field work with track. So work with GBA, Banesh. We have a public outreach um, company, Shocking Associates. And then we're working with Limnotech for the water quality modeling on the river. And, and then our um, outside counsel's aqua law. So you can kind of get a, a sense from the number of firms that I just routed off, really, just that it is a significant effort. There's a lot of coordination, a lot of moving parts. Um, you know, and it's a, it's a collaborative effort in-house between, um, mostly between water pollution control and the engineering division. And then, you know, we have people on the team from finance and legal um, and, and among others. And so far, what we've, what we've done is enhance operations, maintenance, renewal. We've done our system characteriz characterization. I mean, we've gone out and we've inspected our system. We've built a model. We've done flow monitoring. We've calibrated it. I mean, it, I could probably bore you with these details, things that engineers like to talk about, um, to come up with our, with our system of our pipe to, to really model how it reacts to a certain rain event and be able to determine what the impacts are of some rain event here and one that comes again after it. What, what our system can handle, what we can convey in the, the collection system, what we can treat at the plant. Um, we've got a, a model for the river to model how those overflows at different uh, locations and different types could affect the water quality in the river. Um, we're, we're currently wrapping up a financial capability assessment. Really, um, that's a, a framework that's provided by EPA as part of that integrated kind of part of the integrated approach where we can really kind of take a lot of different factors into effect and determine how our community fits. Is it highly burdened? Is it moderately burdened? Is it not burdened? And then all those, that kind of helps us set the stage for negotiations when we get to that, that point. So they are actually considering that, that now as far as the amount of burden that they're creating? Yes, they say they are. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we heard that because earlier on, the, they didn't seem to be carrying a hoot for a holler. I thought we were going to wait till they got done to get the I presentation to ask questions. That. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll get you later. <laughs> uh, 
we, we have been doing public outreach activities. Um, we've been out to liver, livable neighborhoods, and we've had a road show. We've, we've been out uh, to, to a couple dozen, roughly. Um, we went down to the Missouri River 340 and to raise awareness to people that we've got this issue going on. We're working on this plan, and we have we've had plans to come back when we when we work through with you all and we come up with the draft plan to come back and share with them what we found. Um, we've also started a, a community task force effort right now that we've already had we've had one meeting and as the plan comes together we'll be reviewing with them to set priorities as they see them in the community um, we've been doing quite a few early action projects and really those were, were uh, projects we needed to do and it showed epa that we were operating good faith we were continuing to do the right things um, as we work through the partial consent decree and, and our negotiations there um, the work in progress a lot of it's much much of the same um, working through um, the financial planning part, looking at how we're going to get through on whether it be debt financing, pay as you go, um, continuing public engagement and early action projects, and again, trying to get to the plan development, which will be at the end of September of 2016. So I just want to share some of the early findings, um, kind of look behind the curtain a little bit. So far, the EPA said we need to look at three levels of control, you know, a, a, maybe a, a mild level, a moderate level, and a high level. Even if we did the very minimal level that they said we could do, we still can't afford it. It's, it's plain to see we can't afford that. Um, the water quality in the Kansas River still would, the water in the Kansas, Kansas River still would not meet the water quality regulations if we eliminated all of our overflows. So that's um, and, and we also realize that we need to do significant reinvestment and renewal of our system. You know, it's an existing asset, and I've got a map here I'll show you. This map here shows the age of the pipes in our system. I showed this to the standing committee once. Um, all the pipe in red, any, any shade of red, was constructed prior to 1970. So you can see it's a significant portion of our, of our system. The pipes that show up as teal within the red areas, those are pipes that we've done lining through. So we basically pulled through a foldable pipe inside the pipe, and, it, and hard, it hardens inside the pipe, and so we kind of put a new pipe inside the old pipe so you don't have to dig up the street and, and disturb the neighborhood and repair the road and all that that goes with it. So you can see we, there's a significant amount of pipes that have been renewed through the years, and we do a certain amount. We budget every year, and we go out and we're trying to find the worst pipes and hit, hit them in a, a prioritized manner. Um, of course, more to, more to come on that. Oh, I should have said that map, it's kind of hard to see here, so in the handout, I put a fold out, 11 by 17 of that for you. So these are just some, they're not, these aren't the, the worst in our system, and our entire system does not look this way, but just kind of share some photos. This is an internal view of a sewer pipe. You can see it's broken and partially collapsed here. Over time, that would collapse all the way, lead to a blockage. Um, this is a pipe, obviously part of it's worn away over time, so we, we had to dig that out and replace it. This was a, a recent uh, discovery we had at one of our pump stations. The water started spraying out of the pipe. Um, this is a close-up of it. You can see where this is the sunlight coming through the hole in the pipe. So that caused us to do an emergency repair. So these are the kinds of things that we try to go out and we try to find ahead of time so we can do renewal efforts and repair at a least, <coughs> a least cost method versus something like this that's an emergency repair where we had to mobilize a lot of people and standby power, you know, a lot of, a lot of other costly, costly impacts. Um, and here's, here's just a quick summary schedule is it, um, to just kind of bring you up to speed. And so these are the ones, the start point, end point, are, are really what we what we have really set, because that's tonight and we're here, and that's when the plans do and when it will be submitted by. And then in between, this is kind of a, a, a planned engagement with, with you all. Um, these are the, the on threes that we were anticipating the end of February and March timeframe. And then we figured, um, we were thinking after, at the end of those, and we, we 
reviewed this with Doug, and, and that's how we, kind of how we came to this. We thought we'd, there'd be a, a, an executive session with you all. Our outside counsel would come in, and we would really be able to look at the preliminary plan, the draft plan, and talk about strategies and impacts and how we would move forward towards a, towards a final plan. Um, at the bottom, we do have some meetings scheduled with KDHE and, and EPA up front, just to kind of let them know what it's looking like and get their input ahead of time so that we can, we can make sure that we're, we're in the be best position possible when we get to the negotiation timeframes. Um, I should have pointed out too, when we entered the partial consent decree, KDHE is actually a co-defendant with us against EPA because when we went through the negotiations, EPA was on their side of the table to start with. The way that everything was going, they didn't agree with it necessarily, so they came over to our side. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Most consent decrees don't have that, that situation. And with that, now we can go to the questions. Commissioner McKiernan. Do appreciate seeing the scope of, of and I really like this color coded map, except um, I have a lot of the darkest colored lines on this map, and that's not too exciting. I think one of the things that I would really like for you, and I think I'll speak only for myself, but I think I'm speaking for some others, is when you come back, give us some sense of the physical disruption of streets and alleys and right of way and yards that will have to be undertaken to correct this problem. Now, Trent, you, you've chased down probably a half a dozen broken connections for me uh, in just the last few months. It seems like I've got connections failing all over the place. And a lot of times in my district, you guys come back and tell me, well, that pipe's 30 feet down. We got to go get it. All right, so whatever this plan is going to be, how much physical disruption of our space can we expect because that's going to come at a cost of quality of living in the short run that'll be taken care of in the long run. But we need to really prepare people for we're going to have backhoes in the street and we're going to need to bring asphalt, whatever it's going to be, and I don't know, but give me some sense of it because I'm going to have to start preparing myself for it as well as everybody else in my district. I want to I want to point out one I don't want to skip over the slide where the EPA or the Department of Justice has said as of November 20th we are in full compliance thus far so that's a very important aspect um, I hate to have a throwaway slide that says so far so good so that's very important and so I think you guys are doing a great job you are um, new to <laughs> did he know this was going to be on part of his job when he agreed to this in March <laughs> He did, okay, so there you have it. Um, three things that I want to make sure that we're working on as a unified government. This work, we're about to put a lot of money in the ground, literally. It's like flushing money down the toilet, <laughs> literally. I want to make sure we're evaluating economic development around these areas where we're spending a ton of money. Um, we're going, And I also want to make sure we're working on coordination with other utilities and street repairs. Um, so as we look at what are the highest priorities for the sewer projects, let's overlay the highest priorities for street repairs, curb and sidewalk, and other utilities, water. We need to get B, uh, BPU coordinated with it. So when we go into an area and the backhoes come out, the last thing I want to see is a backhoe come out for a combined sewer and then six months later BPU come back and replace a water main. You know, when we get in there, I think there needs to be a pretty comprehensive coordination. I know you do this already, mm -hmm. um, but I want to make sure we step that game up significantly um, because we have an opportunity, because of money we have to spend, to make a really positive impact on parts of our community that are deteriorating. When we can come in and put in new sewers and new utilities and new streets, new sidewalks, we need to look at this as an opportunity. Um, for some redevelopment in some of our hardest hit areas. So I want us to make sure the economic development component is there and that the coordination of services is, are there. The last thing I want to do is dump $50 million underground and what's above ground isn't fit to live in. You know, I want to make sure we're doing the, um, the economic development with this. It's 
it's going to be one of the largest investments in our older areas. And I want to make sure we get the full bang for the buck for our residents in terms of quality of life out of this. So that's one piece, economic development, the coordination of utilities and streets. The other thing I want to make sure is workforce development. Um, I would like to see us do as much of this work in-house as possible. Um, I would like us to hire more people in our, de in our department um, and do a lot of the work that we can do in-house, in-house. Um, it guarantees a couple things. One, it guarantees you're going to get a real wage. Number two, it guarantees residency. So we're going to turn those dollars over in our community. People are going to be buying houses, renting houses in our community. Um, I, if we're going to have to contract some of the work, but the, the more we can bring in-house and ramp up our department, we're going to be doing this for a number of years. This is going to be a 20-year project. That's a good career, good paying jobs that we can bring in-house as a unified government and make sure that our citizens are getting those jobs and we're turning those dollars over in our community um, rather than having contractors coming from where? Down south. Um, let's, let's, have the contract, let's have the residents right here in, in the unified government service area with these high paying jobs. So that workforce development, economic development, coordination with other services for bang for the buck of our community, um, as much money as this is, we've got to look at it as an opportunity to rebuild our city. Um, it's not a fun, topic, but it's an opportunity um, that we need to, we need to leverage. Uh, the, other, the other piece, when will you give us an idea? You said you used the word unaffordable. When will we get an idea about what kind of money we're talking about? Do you know? Do you know or? Well, we're, it, we're, working, we're working through some of that right now when we come back to the on threes. I mean, I can give you some information when when EPA looks at communities, they like to say 2% of a person's median household income. So 2% of MHI, people throw that around a lot. Um, being a burdened community and a poor community, um, if you looked at, one, say, 1 1.5 MHI here, which I'm just throwing numbers out because it, all this is part of negotiations, but that equates to about $50 a month. That 1.5 MHI, $50 a month. Right now, our rates are about $40 a month for sewer. So $50 a month. So we're looking at about a 25% increase, roughly. But $50 a month times 40,000 households? But, I, but I'd also say that that also includes the 450 storm fee would be with the integrated plan. I mean, that's, that's, I mean we're getting off into strategies and some details, but, but I, I think that would be our approach is to try to include the storm, the stormwater fees because that's going to compliance water quality and the sewer rates within that. So when do you anticipate, um, will, will we see start seeing those numbers in the spring, in the summer? When do you think we'll start seeing these numbers? Yeah, you, you should see those numbers then, and that's, we'll, be using, we'll be using some of those numbers to determine, to determine the affordability and the revenue and the money we have to spend to be able to prioritize what we think we're gonna do, and that's part of our proposal and, and plan that we would present to the EPA for, for negotiations after submittal. In the spring. In the spring. So we'll see so some numbers in the spring. Yeah. Um, the other question, the other thing I want to make sure we do, I know that the EPA has, requires in the, con, in the consent decree to have some green infrastructure and not just gray infrastructure. Um, we've talked about um, Big 11 Lake goes right through the middle of our downtown, is a waterway. Um, one of the things that an opportunity that's presented itself through the Healthy Campus is that that uh, Waterway Park, Big 11 Lake, and down through Sumner to Jersey Creek um, can become a signature green space that can offset some of the requirements for EPA. I made the mistake once of saying that's money we already have. That's not true. It's money we already have to spend, I think is the accurate way to say it. Um, but we can use you can use green space for some stormwater capture, not sewer capture, but stormwater capture um, that can help as a part of the bigger plan. So um, my understanding is you all are working on that downtown corridor as part of this plan. Is that right? We, we are. We, we've been in, we've got a preliminary meeting set up um, with them. We'll be meeting with them right after the first of the year and looking at that opportunity. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things we were realizing as we go through this, and we showed it with that red map, we have so many, so many basic needs just to protect our assets that we already have. That 
I mean, that is going to consume a lot of dollars. And that may be what we do for many years is go out and renew our system and, and try to try to get ahead of the curve to where we're doing the trenchless repair and saving the, the dig ups because that's more expensive, more disruptive and try to try to be able to do real asset management and, and hit the right pipes at the right time to extend their life for the least cost possible. So, I mean, that's really what we're seeing initially is there's a huge need for dollars spent for that, you know, it's that deferred maintenance and everyone knows what the streets look like and when they're bad, what needs to be done, but the sewer pipes underground and out of sight and out of mind. So they, they've been maybe a little bit neglected over the years. Do we capture methane gas off our system? We do not. We actually, currently what we do with our treatment process down at Call Point is um, we run it through an incinerator. So the volatiles that are in the sludge that would be generating that actually helps us to burn the sludge so we don't have to add as much natural gas. We are currently building a project um, down at Call Point and we'll be mothballing those incinerators. The reason being the EPA has new air emissions standards which BPU is being affected by that we would be too costly to, to, to renovate that, bring it to standards. And so we're, we're going away from that. We're going to dewater and landfill for now. But there's an opportunity maybe down the road it might make sense that we might look at something with, that could involve methane gas. Yes. But, but that's, <coughs> there's no plans for that right now. And we're phasing out the burning? We are. Okay. Yeah, that'll, that, that will likely go offline um, before the summer of next year. Any other questions? Yeah, just a quick clarification. Uh, so you said in the spring we'll be hearing some more definite numbers, correct? Yes. So I guess you were planning on bringing back those definite definite numbers to the standing committee in April. Is that what you were thinking? Commissioner, there's there's a couple different ways wondering. we may approach that. I mean, there may be the standing committee piece. Depending on how it depends, on our negotiations with the EPA. Some of that might be in an executive session that we come back and talk through that. I know there's a certain number of them we want to come back and talk about overview and things and system costs that we want it to be a public meeting. Right. But then it's the crossover to which points we are in our strategy that we'll want to be okay, going so through this, that on the litigation. So aspect. basically this is etched in jello right now. That's kind of right. I mean, that's okay, why we that's see fine. this in no, various phases to which we come back and we can talk about just some clarification on issues and that's why Trenton was referring to on threes as maybe times where commissioners can engage on points right. but then when we're talking about presentations as far as how we want to move forward and strategies then it's a between this type of setting or executive sessions because that's when we do more policy making right well I'm just tapping into the same concept that the mayor was about letting our public know what's going on and some numbers like you know some of the other commissioners were asking about that's why I asked that well if I understood correctly that's not April that's next month oh well yeah now you're asking for a breakout of what our how our system is set up today and how we pay for everything that's a different question than what he's gone through tonight that that sets that's how we've got to where we are today and then the other part then we'll look at how we're going to work with future costs that'll come to the system so in your timeline, there's another blue line in January in front of the commission. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, and I just don't want anybody being confused leaving here that we're waiting until the end of February to hear anything else. Yeah, we may end up doing that at a regular meeting just to be able to get it in the calendar. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, one of the most expensive enterprises we have is unified government is our legacy sewer system. And um, it is out of sight, out of mind. We spend a tremendous amount of money on it already, and there's more coming. And so we just need to make sure our, our commission and our public understand the scope of what we're doing. So we appreciate the initial presentation tonight. We appreciate your work on it. Um, and we have a, a lot of people putting their heads together to try to how to make, how to make this as affordable as possible and meet the environmental um, expectations so all right if there are no other questions I want to thank you and we will um, move from here we are going to meet downstairs we will start it takes 10 to 15 minutes to turn it we'll start at 705 
um, downstairs in our commission meeting. Thank you, Thank for, you watching. for watching. Please visit Please our website, visit our website at, at www.wycokck.org for a complete listing of our schedule for public meetings.